don't be afraid to travel. Don't be afraid to bet on yourself. Like I, I live my entire life on like, I'm going to bet on what I think is going to work. Like, yeah, and that led me to quitting huge. WWE. That led me to like different decisions in my life. Wrestling is life. Wrestling is life. Wrestling is life. Is wrestling. Welcome everyone to another episode of Wrestling as Life is Wrestling with Cody Diener. I am Cody Diener and I am a professional wrestler. I'm a professional wrestling producer with TNA Wrestling. I'm a professional speaker traveling all across the nation delivering my story to youth and telling them the lessons I've learned along the way. I am also a father to four children and a husband to one beautiful wife and this is my podcast. Welcome back. If you are an avid listener, thanks for coming back. If this is your first time ever listening to this show, welcome for the very first time. Welcome to episode 48, part one with Sammy Callahan. Man, episode 48. We're creeping up to episode 52, which would be the one year anniversary of this show. Almost a year ago, I decided to start this project of speaking with wrestlers or people that are involved in the wrestling business in some capacity and letting them share their journey with me, but not just share their journey, pick apart their journey, see if we can pull some lessons out of that journey because I know in my life speaking to multiple wrestlers I've learned a lot of lessons life lessons from these wrestlers and their crazy journeys like my own because I know that wrestling is life and life is wrestling hence the name of the show. I'm super excited about today's episode with Sammy Callahan. I worked with Sammy Callahan very, very closely in TNA Wrestling when I was the leader of the design. I took over to the design, made it this new thing as it morphed from Violent by Design into the design. And the very first person that I feuded with, mainly the whole time I was with the design, was Sammy Callahan. We had a lot of fun. I got to pick his brain about how he viewed professional wrestling and also had some personal conversations about how he viewed life, and I knew he'd be a great guest for this show. Sammy, in the middle of this conversation, says, man, I'm sharing stuff with you that I have never shared before. I'm giving you more details in this conversation than I have with anybody for any podcast I've ever done. So... Thank you, Sammy, for being so open, being a complete open book with me. And this conversation is like none that I've had on the show before. We go through in detail Sammy's journey from when he started in professional wrestling to when he signed with the WWE, when he left WWE, and all the things that led to that, and then his journey into TNA wrestling and what he's doing right now with his wrestling school. Man, we go into great, great detail. More detail than I was expecting. More detail than I asked for. But within those details, man, there is so many lessons to be learned because Sammy is an interesting cat, and he has a story to tell. And I know you guys are going to enjoy this conversation part one with Sammy as you're listening and you're deciding that man I am definitely enjoying this conversation and this project that Cody Diener is putting together well consider supporting me in multiple ways one you can just take a screenshot of yourself listening to this take a screenshot on your phone put it up on your social media and tag me at Cody Diener you could also rate or review the show on your podcast platform of choice. You can also go subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com at Cody Diener podcast, or you can support my sponsors. Go to restwhendead.ca, get yourself some wicked awesome fitness apparel, or if you need some supplements to up your workout game, go to ceofit.ca. If you want to support me personally, there's a couple ways you can do that. Number one, you can go to my Pro Wrestling Tea store at prowrestlingtees.com slash Cody Diener. Get yourself a t-shirt or maybe you want to get yourself a personalized video at cameo.com slash Cody Diener. Better yet, go to my Patreon. This entire conversation this week 
part one, episode 48, as well as next week's episode 49, part two with Sammy, is up. Right now, it was uploaded early and ad-free this past weekend over at patreon.com slash Cody Diener. You can sign up for a free trial right now, and you can get all the episodes early, ad-free, as well as bonus stories. There is a bonus story up right now, which is a doozy with Sammy Callahan. Why don't you go check that out right now? Patreon.com slash Cody Diener. Get yourself a free trial and support this show and help me bring it free to you each and every week now i'm super busy it's like this summer total non-stop summer tour from tna is off and running it's just been announced i'm all over the place i'm also wrestling a whole bunch with multiple indie promotions if you want to book me this summer i have a few dates left open this summer if you're an indie promoter why don't you drop me an email book cody at cody and let me share my love of professional wrestling with you and your fans if you want to bring me to your school are you a principal a teacher administrator or no a teacher principal or administrator and are interested in bringing me to your school for a presentation i'm already booking into the fall right now and in the u.s schools goes back in august in a lot of places so i'm starting to fill my dates in right now why don't you head on over to chris gray speaks Dot com. That's gray with an A, chrisgrayspeaks.com, and fill in the booking form, and you can inquire about bringing me to your school or your place of business this summer or this fall. I want to tell you more about my busy schedule, the total nonstop summer tour, and everywhere I'm going to be over the next number of weeks and months, but I will do that at the end of the show. So you can stick around to the end of the show and see where you can find me and my traveling merch table and all the things that I'm doing in the wrestling world, but we'll do that at the end of the show. Right now, we will hop into part one with my friend and soon to be yours, the Sammy Callahan. All right, let's get started. I'm here with my brother, Sammy Callahan. I was just saying how I wanted to talk to you because I respect the hell out of you. I want to bring people that are my friends, but that I respect people, not just my friends, people I respect, people who are successful in like all different avenues of the business. And you're somebody that has done that. You've been everywhere, done everything, started your own promotion, became super successful with that. So like, I kind of want to just talk about, talk about it all. You say you're an open book. So I'm just a baby, bro. I'm just a baby, (laughs) man. I don't even know where I want to start with you, brother. Like I could, we could kind of start anywhere. Um, United States, 1947. <laughs> bro, we're getting some history. I'm a history yeah. buff. Are you? I didn't you, know that about Bro, you. you know you're getting old when you, like, as a kid, hated history stuff, yeah. hated A&E and the History right. Channel. As an adult, bro, the news is the best reality show on the planet right now. Oh, it is. You're right about that. Bro, it's hilarious. <laughs> like, it it's, it's it can be a comedy. It can be a horror. It can be suspenseful. It can be everything. It's, That's right. Politics and the news is WWE, TNA, AEW right now. Right? Yeah, man. It's true. It is it is hilarious. I don't I, I don't want to talk politics, but I mean, we can, but that's, I've never done that on the podcast. I, want no, to I don't think we about, need to get into that. We don't need to get into that. I want to talk more about you and kind of your journey uh, in this crazy, wild, insane world of professional wrestling and then see if we can pull out maybe some some lessons that you have specifically learned along that way in the journey. And I think that those lessons are going to be able to help somebody listen to this, whether a wrestling fan or a businessman or, wh- or whoever they are, um, they can get something from Sammy Callahan. Let me start with this. What was your first moment where you were like, OK, this is my thing? wrestling is my thing do you remember was there a moment was there a, a person does that exist for you 100 percent. ah i may be one of the rare people everyone's like oh my lifelong fan it's like when did you start watching wrestling i started watch, watching wrestling seventh eighth grade yeah my earliest memories is professional wrestling me too like, 
straight up. Uh, I remember being a kid at the time. My bro my brothers are 10, 11 years older than me. I was a total accident. My my dad was in his 50s when he had me. Oh, I, wow. I, I am a miracle baby. Not to go on. My mother had her tubes tied and my dad had his tubes tied. What? Accidental baby. Are you kidding me? No, I was I was born like four months early, premature. I was in the hospital the first year of my life. I became a big wow. strong boy. Yeah. Bro, that's amazing. But that is that is legit amazing. You just blew my mind. That you're a shoot miracle. That's a, that's a shoot. Yes. Because that's my, like I was not spoke like my brothers are 10 to 11 years older than me. Then I just popped up. Like was wow. not supposed to happen. My parents always joked when I was a kid, it was like it was a cold night in Ohio, like when you were born. <laughs> uh Oh, but man, uh, awesome. no professional wrestling. I remember being a kid, and some of my earliest memories was I I I can think back to when I'm like two or three years old, and mm. I can remember memories from that. Mm. And I remember two big ones. One of them was watching the original viewing of It by Stephen King. I was way too young to be watching that stuff. My parents were they were we were a horror family like they put it into my head when i was a kid like this isn't real like this is just what we do we watch horror movies i remember because it, it was a mini series i remember watching it as like hiding behind like i was like oh i can't deal with this as a two or three year old yes uh, and i remember professional wrestling my brothers at the time they're 10 11 most kids when they're around that age like professional wrestling and they grow out of it uh and i remember they had all the old ljn figures like a ton of them and they were getting in that uh they were getting into that habit as preteens about to become teenagers where they become really destructive. And so they were like destroying these action figures, like nailing them to trees, blowing them up. And I remember as a kid stealing a bunch of them from them because I really liked them and I didn't want them to get like destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then like going forward, like professional wrestling, that's like all I ever knew. Like I, I, my parents did something called a me box where they just kept stuff from my childhood and just put it oh, in this cool. box, uh -huh. like different reports and stuff like that. And I remember looking at it even a couple of years ago and as far back as first grade, it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it was like wrestling. It was always wrestling. Mm -hmm. There was no mm -hmm. other option. Everything I did in my life through adolescence, through middle school, through high school was what can I do to one day become a professional wrestler? I got into amateur wrestling mm -hmm. because I thought it was professional wrestling. I learned real mm -hmm. quick. It wasn't, but I ended up loving it and uh, became a pretty good amateur wrestling growing up. Uh, mm -hmm. I got into theater because I'm like, oh, that's like the acting of professional wrestling. That'll help me with that. So I got into musical theater and show course and everything else, but it was all because I wanted to be a professional wrestler. I was one of those kids like, uh, I had friends in every group. Mm -hmm. Like I was a jock. I played football. I was in track. Uh, I did a year of tennis. We don't need to ask about that. I was an amateur wrestler, but uh, so I was friends with all the jocks or I was friends with all the musical kids because I was yes. in that stuff for professional wrestling. And then I was friends with all the juggalos because they liked pro wrestling. Like, yeah. So like I, I had a friend in every different friend group. Oh man. I that whole introduction to your love of wrestling is like so relatable to me like everything that you said except for the miracle the miracle baby thing but that's amazing i can't get that in my baby. head because that's that's so cool but like the fact that you the ljn era that's me i'm a little bit older than you but i also remember watching it i was just talking to my son about this the other day watching that it special that mini series that was on tv that's there's images from that that are ingrained in my mind that that, that was at my, my too. that was at my original house and we only lived there till i was like three years old so that's yeah. how i know how young i was because i remember it in that house yeah, yeah. remember that I, yeah. I i and people say like, you don't remember memories that way. i remember yep no, you i remember can. the first sure. i remember one of the first times my dad gave me a bath as a kid mm. like i remember that like that's interesting and i've had a lot of a lot of head injuries in my time professional wrestling. Yeah. I don't have a great <laughs> short term memory, but Neither when it comes I. to professional wrestling and like yeah. early stuff, yeah. like it's, I can see it like a, I could draw a picture. I could direct yeah. a movie and it could be exact. That's interesting. So then like you, when I got into, you know, middle school and high school, I was also friends with everybody because I was a, I, I did some drama stuff with, the, with, with the drama kids. I was a musician. So I was with the, the punk rockers, but then I was also a jock cause I also played football and basketball. So like I was friends with everybody too. I was a, exactly the same way. Um, were your parents supportive of this Extremely. idea? Extremely. Were they? I got so uh, like, 
I know a lot of people, especially people in professional wrestling, it seems like they came from broken homes or Mm -hmm. messed up families. I got extremely lucky. My two parents were together for almost 40 years, even though I find out as an adult, like I thought it was all cookies and ice cream. It wasn't like my dad was just a good man and was like, nah, uh, you get married once you stay with that lady, Mm -hmm. especially they had the three boys, me and my two brothers. Uh, But I got extremely lucky. Anything I got into, my parents were like full blown. Like awesome. not, none of my brothers were really amateur wrestlers or anything. They're more football. And my other brother was cross country. I was like, Oh, I want to get into wrestling. Okay. Let's go get you some shoes. Like wow. even, and yeah. like, I got really lucky also. Cause like, as an adult, I feel like I value stuff way more than some people that may have came from a more privileged lifestyle. Yeah. I went through every lifestyle. Like when I was really young, we were really poor. Cause my dad had a heart attack and had to retire. My mom went on to work and like, mm. but she ended up like, my mom was a hustler. She hustled and went on to uh, work at Honda and got like a big time job there. And we were really, really good on money and uh, pretty, we were white trash Kings. Like we had a farm, we had trucks, <laughs> we had four wheelers, we had dirt really? bikes. But yeah. then I remember my mom had gotten really sick and she couldn't work at Honda anymore. And we ended up going bankrupt for that and lost everything and ended up in a trailer for a year. Uh, when I was like in high school, but my mom, and I think this helps me in professional wrestling and also mm-hmm like with running a promotion. My mom was a hustler, dude. My mm-hmm. mom was like, oh, I'm sick. I can't work at Honda. No, I'm going out. Like my mom made a hundred thousand dollars the next year selling Tupperware and got it. And they gave her a free car. So that's how Hell we got a good yeah. car back. Wow. I was always the kid growing up. Like if we were selling candy bars, popcorn for boy scouts, sausage and cheese for band, my mom's like, get in the car. We're going door to door. Like, yeah. like, Ever, I was the, always the kid that like got the main prize because I always sold the most of whatever it was. That's where you got your entrepreneurial spirit. Is from one hundred percent. And then I got a a hard work ethic also from my father. Like my father is very much if you want something, you you go out and do it. Like mm-hmm. there's no oh you you lost my my dad was a saint of a human being. Like he wouldn't swear around women. Where my mom was like complete opposite end of the spectrum like yeah. swore like a sailor yeah. my dad was like very very republican my mom was very very democratic oh interesting uh, yeah. yeah so i got the best of kind of both worlds oh, with that cool. my dad cool. was very much you don't swear around women yeah you, yeah you, you say yes uh yes sir no sir you mm-hmm. say thank you like Knowing me, like people, I don't think people would guess it. I'm a very polite person, like an overly yeah. polite person. Like, yeah, yes, sir, are. no, sir. Yeah, yeah. What would you like? Absolutely. Yeah. Like, and I, that's where I got lucky with my parents. Like, they were supportive in anything I did. Like, when I, uh, in high school, like, uh, we were all backyard wrestlers and we all worked our ass off one summer to buy a ring. Mm-hmm. And we bought a ring and we were running shows in our high school and like going out selling tickets at Walmart. And we draw like three, four hundred people's backyard wrestlers. And we, oh my God, that's awesome. And we would uh, book shitty indie wrestlers to come do our <laughs> show to like teach us stuff. Right. So like we were all kind of technically in the business at like 14, 15, 16 years old. Yeah. Uh, and then we ended up all, some of us ended up going and getting trained and everything else. But I remember I was, I went to college for uh, amateur wrestling and I was going for digital me- multimedia design and film. Oh, cool. And uh, I ended up getting being prof- I, I had it like a minor wrestling scholarship. Mm-hmm. So I was like excited about that. And because of pro wrestling, I did a hangman off the apron that summer, right before college. And I broke my foot. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was going to get red shirted my Mm. freshman year and it made me real and i i college just wasn't for me i was not like at that point i had already been doing graphics since like seventh grade for a backyard wrestling company and editing films and i felt like they would just use me as an example for the class like oh this is how you do this i felt like i was teaching the class at that point so i was like college isn't for me and i remember a bunch of my buddies like oh shark boy's doing this training camp and i i came home from college one day i was like I'm using the rest of my tuition money to get trained for pro wrestling. And my parents were mad for like 30 minutes, but they're like, look, if this is what you want to do, you got to do it now. And you can't live life. Like wondering what if like, wow. like maybe it, work, it might not work out, but like they are extremely supportive. To, I, I went the long way to answer that question. Cause you got me in a talking mood today. Yeah, but, uh, buddy. No, it's awesome. So uh, it, it, what's interesting is that exact advice that your parents gave you it was the opposite of what my dad gave me because he wanted me to go to school and go to college and I wanted to go to wrestling school. But I, I made a deal with my dad to do what your parents told you. I said, I have to do it now because a lot can happen and I can't say what if, 
what if? Because I found a school I can do now. I promise I'm going to continue to go to college. I'll get my education. I'll do all that. But I got to do the wrestling now. I I love that your parents were that supportive and that insightful to be able to see like this is what my son is obviously passionate about and he's got we got to encourage him to do it you were like you said you were lucky you're very lucky bro because that's not extremely yeah. they were uh one of the the best moments of my life was when i my mom had already passed away god rest her soul my dad was really sick i had like right before i was getting ready to go to wwe i moved back into my dad in ohio to help take care of him mm -hmm. and uh he was really sick. He ended up living another like two and a half years after that. But being able to like sign my WWE contract, yeah, like in man. front of my father being like, everything was worth it. Like I did it. And at that time, like looking great, it wasn't a lot of money to me at that time. It was the most money on the planet. I was yeah. like, I did it with wrestling. Yes. Like no one ever expected me or no one. You're never getting signed. Yeah. I th you're this five foot eight freaking weird white kid from ohio like at, when i first got to wrestling i was 330 pounds like you i was not the guy to get signed like right and to be able to show my father like i i, I did it i fucking did it like yeah oh man that is so special i uh man you're put you're spread tear to my eye sammy geez i wasn't expecting that today uh that is <clears throat> again i can relate to that i I wasn't 330 pounds. I was about 200 pounds less than that. I was 130 pounds soaking wet. The Opposite my end of the spectrum. Yeah, right. And, but lived in this small little white trash community with four trailer parks and was doing backyard wrestling with my brothers and my friends in the backyard. And it was like, everyone was like, oh, that, that kid loves wrestling and he thinks he's going to do it. But like, everyone, that's not going to happen. Like, I like, made a bet with my high school wrestling coach who was like supportive, but also kind of made fun of like the pro wrestling thing. I was like, by the time I'm 21, I'll sign a contract with WWE. Oh yeah, sure. You will. And we made this bet. It was like a uh, hundred, a hundred dollar bet like to do yeah. this. Uh -huh. And I remember I signed a contract at 24, like yeah. compared to 21. But I remember he, he went out of his way to hit me up. He's like, yo, like, <laughs> you we never expected this to happen yeah right. do you believe happened. do you believe in this like there's a lot of i listen to a lot of motivational stuff and there's you know there's a lot of there's this thinking about putting that idea even into the universe like even you making that bet is like i'm putting this out there this isn't something that i'm just even internalizing i'm externalizing this idea i'm putting this out into the universe that this is going to happen i think that is partially helps us at least focus on a goal do you believe that there's something to that in terms of putting that out there, that idea? 100%. Uh, like, I am a God-fearing man to begin with, but I'm also very big on karma. I'm also very big mm. on, like, like what happens happens for a reason. Like, yeah, me too. The, the universe isn't going to put too much on your plate that you can't handle. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's like, those those are different lessons we learn in life. Like, and I'm very big on uh, the karma thing. Like, karma comes around one way or the other like and you can only take from karma so much without making the deposit i forget mm. who said that in an interview lately mm, interesting and it, yeah. but it like hit so home with me so much that it's like you have to make you can't i think it was cat williams actually like in his okay. infamous interview he's done recently but he's like yeah. you can't just let take and take and take you got to make deposits back into yeah. karma or yeah, eventually like the bank's going to be empty yeah you know, so. yeah so when you started wrestling school, then like your parents were supportive and you, you know, had, you know, outside factors thinking that this isn't going to work. This isn't going to happen. Like what made you think that you could actually do this when you started? Because a lot of guys in our generation, you know, that attitude era and then grew up in the, with the eighties wrestling, like they all loved wrestling. were passionate about it, but there's something about you that not only made you go to wrestling school, but made you actually think you could do this, even though you had all these naysayers. Was it the support of your family or? I think it was, was everything. Else? I'm yeah. very oriented person. I don't like being told you can't do something. I, I know that's mm. cliche, yeah, but it's very yeah. much so like there was no other option. When I first, I started training and then I was like, I, I got to like train wherever I can. Like I wanted to be in the ring seven days a week if I could like, mm. and it's so crazy and it, nothing against the new generation, but I run a school it's not the same anymore. Like people's no, like, not. Oh, I, I, I got, I got a hangnail. I can't come to training. You would have to cut off both my legs and both my arms 
to yeah. keep me from coming to training or going to a show and helping set up for 10 hours. It's like, just hopefully get a look eventually. Uh, I went from one house to another cause I was like a, a poor kid. And like, as much as I should have been more responsible and got a job, but like all my time went to wrestling. Like I, I mm. woke up, I breathed, sleep, mm -hmm. ate professional wrestling. So like, mm -hmm. I went to like one group of wrestlers house. I lived there until I like outwore my welcome, not being able to pay, pay bills and then went mm -hmm. to the next place just so I could be in areas of chain and then the next place and the next place and the next place. Mm -hmm. And I just kept popping around because like all my time was for professional wrestling, like every, every single second of every minute. So what, what lessons and takeaways, like for one, even as you were, I, I wanted to, I'm circling back to this now because it was a thought that popped in my head when you're talking about your mom and also the different lifestyles that you grew up with, you know, because of the, the different income levels. I was thinking as you were saying, like, that must have prepared you big time for independent wrestling because you learn to be poor. If you can learn to be poor, then you can learn to survive on the indies. Right. And dude, still make 100%. Yeah. There was times where I was so poor, dude, and I didn't want to just always ask my parents for money. Mm -hmm. Like, there was times where, like, I would have like six dollars to my name. That was a lot of money to me at that time, <laughs> where it's like, okay, well, I need gas money to get to training. Training's 35, 40 minutes away. We have training three days this week. Uh, what, what am I? And I, I try to average out my head. It's like, okay, I go to the grocery store. It's like, okay, I get like four cans of green beans. That's six meals. I eat half a can of green beans. I get a big bag of Doritos. Like that's some sort of sustenance. I get a two liter of soda and like, yeah, yeah, to drink for like four days. Like, right, yeah. That's why, like, I, I, I do like appreciate everything that professional wrestling has given to me. Like, but I gave everything to professional wrestling. Yeah, and I try to tell young talent, and I try to tell kids that I'm training. Like, look, if you give everything to wrestling, like eventually. Hopefully it'll pay you back, but like mm -hmm. you, you can't, I had, I had a student, uh, quit recently, which I thought was going to be the last kid to quit. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was like the first one of the new group, like getting matches. He was starting to travel. He was like, and he, I thought he was going to be pretty good. Uh, one day he just hit me up. He's like, ah, I, I think I'm quitting. And I was like, what? I was like, this is, you're the last person. He's like, yeah, man. Like I didn't realize it was going to be so much travel and it was going to be like, I'm, I'm poor and I'm like, I, I'm like, bro, that's, that's, that's wrestling. At least, you know, now, like, at least, yeah. you know, now before you put everything into it. Uh, but I said something to him, he worked at a screen printing shop and I was like, look, man, like in 20 years, you're not going to be glad you were a screen printer, but in like 20 years, you might be like sad that you didn't try to make it as a pro wrestler. And like, yeah. you have to let people make their own decisions. And his decision was, uh, yeah. Go back to be a civilian, but right? for a lack of better terms. <laughs> but like, yeah, I always live my life like that. I was like, yeah. I'm never gonna one day regret this shitty. Um, I'm never gonna be glad I worked this shitty job mm -hmm. for six bucks an hour. But I yeah. will regret like not giving everything to professional wrestling. Yeah. So you learned that lesson from your mom. You're, and that's a that's a good thing to pass on to your students, man. Like it, but but like you said, it's also good that they learn that now. I remember when my first road trip. For on an indie weekend and getting done the road trip and being like when can i do this again that was awesome i liked the road there was two guys that were on that road trip that never did another road trip and they quit wrestling because like man they didn't like the travel i that was one reason i knew i was gonna last because i'm like oh i like the road i and, love and, travel there was yeah, dude yeah. like so i i have i have so i i hate ragging on some of my students but like <laughs> they they bitch about mm -hmm. school travel like we, Alex Cologne, who's like kind of one of the part-time trainers there, one of the best deathmatch wrestlers in the world, but also a really good professional wrestler. He's like, he hit up the, the group chat for the school. He's like, hey, I got a show in Jersey this week. It's about seven and a half hours. Uh, anyone wants to come along, I'd probably get you booked. Every single one of them made an excuse. What? Like, oh, that's just wow. really far. That's just really far. It's review time. Let's take a minute right now to take a pause from this conversation to do a supplement review brought to you by CEOfit.ca. Today's product is by the Iron Brothers Supplements. They talk about grit, guts, and glory. That's their byline, and they are an awesome company. Let's talk today about Ruthless Pre-Workout. Specific flavor, raspberry ice pop now 
I'm not a big pre-workout guy. I've never been one of those people that has to make sure that I get a pre-workout into my system before I start pumping iron. So I just decided, well, you know what? I want to start testing out some of these supplements that I'm going to be advertising on the show. And I'm not going to advertise something until I use it. So like I said, I'm not a pre-workout guy. I'm, I'm not big on them, but I might as well give it a shot. Let's see if I like it and approve of it and give it a thumbs up before I start hyping it to my listeners. Well, let me tell you, there's some a lot of positive things about this. Number one, it's made in Canada. I love that. It's from Lucasville, Nova Scotia. That's where the I Am Brother Supplement Company is located. Look at that sweet logo, by the way. If you're watching this on YouTube, they got a really cool logo. And this pre-work just gets you jacked, bro. <laughs> like it just gets you so pumped. And the first time I took a dose, I was like, man, I was just feeling it through my body. I was getting jacked. I was lifting heavier and more than I was ever lifting. And then I, for my second workout, I looked and realized, oh, I took twice as much as, as needed. The, the serving suggested serving is actually only half a scoop on this thing. You need barely any of it. So the taste isn't super overwhelming. You don't need to have a lot of water. You don't need to like chug this giant thing of water. So then you feel bloated during your entire workout. Nope. You just put a half a scoop in there. It gets you jazz. It gets you ready for your workout. You just do it 20, 30 minutes before your workout and you are ready to go. So thumbs up from Cody Diener for the I Am Brothers Ruthless Pre-Workout Raspberry Ice Pop Flavor. If you like, you know, your raspberry, your blueberry, your strawberry, any berry, I very much suggest that you get this berry ice pop flavor from the I Am Brothers, and you get it today at ceofit.ca orders of over 120 bucks get free shipping but uh, hey if you just want to get this no orders over 20 bucks that's fine i mean the super cheap shipping it's like 750 in canada or only six bucks in the u.s we ship all over north america at ceofit.ca so if you want some pre-workout or any of your top of the line supplementary needs where do you need to go you know where to go ceofit.ca what's that i said ceofit.ca dude i would drive me and my boys would drive 20 out we drove one time we went from ohio to chicago which is about five and a half hours to work a battle royal on a shitty show for no pay <laughs> then we drove from chicago to jersey to go to a kenta seminar that that's like 18 hours on yep. well, zero because we're like no, this is what we got to do yes like we're yes. a big ring of honor fans we want to wrestle the ring of honor kenta's the man like why would we not go yeah. 15 hours of training with kenta that's a steal yeah <laughs> so i love that you're trying to i mean you're i know you're saying you're ragging on them but you're also you got to instill this stuff into the next generation you know otherwise you're just doing them a disservice what was there a main lesson that or two that was instilled in you in wrestling school and those that first year of training that you still either remember or apply to your life today? Is there, you know, one or two things that your trainers really helped put in you so that you've kept with you? The, the big one. And like, and this is like so cliche, but it's like the wrestling business owes you nothing. Yeah. Like we, we always try to say it's like the business owes you nothing. Like I see so many, like social media legit makes me want to eat my PlayStation it makes me so mad sometimes, <laughs> but it's like a person that's been in the business for two years. They're like, I've given everything to this business mm. and it hasn't given me anything. I, I deserve this, 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 and this. And it's like two years in the grand scheme of thing is nothing. It's nothing like nothing. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I don't be afraid to travel. Don't be afraid to bet on yourself. Like I, I live my entire life on like, I'm going to bet on what I think is going to work. Like, yeah, and that led me to quitting WWE. That led me to like different decisions in my life. Like, yeah. Yeah. So what was your first big break then? I want to get, I definitely want to talk to you about the WWE stuff. Cause that's, I think, man, that's fascinating. Cause that's the, that's kind of the goal for guys our age, right? If that was the pinnacle, but what, this is probably hard to answer. Maybe detail, but like what led to that signing? Was it like the, 
the HWA kind of stuff that helped you or was it the, the combat zone notoriety or like, I think it was like, everything and like everything. Okay. Everything. And like, I got, I was very goal oriented when I first got into the business, I was a big indie wrestling mark. And at that time, like IW mid South CZW Chikara ring of honor was like the, the end all be alls. Okay. And I remember when I got in business, I was like in three years, I want to be in like a position. I don't know why I used him, but like, he was like an indie name at the time. I was like, I want to be in a position like delirious, like mm. delirious is wrestling everywhere. He's from the Midwest. Like exactly. for some reason it was him. Like I was yeah, like, I want to yeah. be on the same level as like delirious or Matt Seidel, like those guys. And everything was like pure luck. Like one thing after another. So like I got booked for, I, I, Really wanted to wrestle for CZW because it was the ECW arena. Chikara was really big at the time. I wanted to do Chikara. I was like starting to make a name at IWA Mid-South. And I also wrestled this other promotion that I feel like doesn't get the credit it deserves for what it did. There was a company in Indianapolis called Insanity Pro Wrestling. And it was kind of like where Ian got all of his young talent from. To be honest, okay. like it was like, like okay. the talent to come through there. Ricochet, Chuck Taylor, me, Moxley, Drake Younger. Like the list goes on and on and on. Like. Uh -huh. was from that core group but mm -hmm. i remember i had worked one of quack students vin gerard at the time yeah. and like we had a really good match and quack booked me for young lions cup which at the point i was like that was my goal like yes uh -huh. like and this seems like it's a movie but it's real life and it's like because everything just this is why i tell my students all it takes is one thing to click yeah. and like it, it's like off to the races so i got booked is like my first northeast tour like oh I, I get to go do i get to go do chikara and they're like you're okay you're on night one which is friday and night two which is sunday in easton pa or something like that uh i'm like awesome just by chance czw was running that saturday at the ecw arena and a bunch of my boys were like yo uh come just come to the show we'll get you on like we'll get you on so it's like okay awesome so uh, I did car that first night and uh, had a great match with Vin Gerard. And I met this old man there. Uh, that was like when I was out selling merch and like, he was just this old man, like super nice. And he was like talking about old school, like wrestling from the sixties or seventies. And the reason I'm telling you this, cause it comes into the story. Yes. Of course. So I'm this old man, just super nice, everything like that. Awesome. Like, uh, oh yeah, man. Like at the same point trying to sell some merch but it's like also this guy's this guy has some cool knowledge like let's yeah. talk to him so i had a great match uh the next day i went to czw and i got thrown in like a a, a random bullshit kind of get over match with one of their veteran guys a guy named john dahmer who had been there forever and he just beat people up that was the thing but i got me and him had an awesome match randomly to the point where czw is like if you get in the car with the naptown dragon guys we'll book you every time i was like great Awesome. The next night I'm back at Chikara and I was in a six man tag with like me and whoever versus Chuck Taylor, Icarus and Grand Akuma was like the top eel group because we got eliminated on the first night. And uh, I randomly had a moment from that that went kind of viral because I told someone I was going to stab him in the match and with Chikara, <laughs> that kind of dumb shit, like yeah. always randomly popped off. But like I got super over not only at CZW, but also Jakara that same weekend. And I remember one of the Ring of Honor students was on the show, uh, Sugarfoot Alex Payne. Okay, yeah. I don't know if you remember that. He's like, I oh, yeah, man. He's like, day. oh, man, uh, Kerry Silken, the owner of Ring of Honor, is here. He wants to talk to you because, like, we're in, we're in Dayton next next week. I was like, oh, yeah, like, that's, like, one of my dreams. Like, I had been going to Ring of Honor shows since high school at that same building. And, like, I knew, like, to get into Ring of Honor, you had to get invited to come set up the ring, and then you'd get a dark match and, like, Gabe would look at you and give you, and he's like, oh yeah, Carrie wants to meet you. He he thinks you could be like the next Samoa Joe. I was like, oh yeah, that's my dream. Like, so <laughs> Carrie walks back. Little did I know it was that old fucking man that I uh, talked to on night one. And yeah. he's like, because I was nice to him and everything else. He's like, he's like, oh, I see a lot in you. He's like, next week we're in, uh, we're in Dayton. I know you live in that area. Uh, come set up the ring. I'll make sure you get a dark match. Mm -hmm. So I was like, set. And yeah. like, so within a two week span, I debuted for Chikara, CZW and ring of honor, like, which at that point, that footage, like I made my own highlight videos before people really did that on YouTube and everything else and promos and everything else. The second that footage came out, I ripped it off the DVDs. I made a highlight video. So it looked like, oh, he's wrestling. I do mid South Chikara, CZW and ring of honor. All like, who is this guy? And that like blew me up to the next level. Like that was like, that was like the first big break that really like 
started the 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 downfall of things. Yeah. So there's two two things lessons that really stand out to me. There's way that. more to this, but we'll we'll go in chapters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. I love yeah. this. So one is you said you were lucky, but yes, but no. Because one one thing about that story is, and I say this to young guys all the time, is like you can't take yourself out of the game. If you say no to something and take yourself out of the game, then you're not going to get an opportunity. So just like your students who decide, oh, I, I don't want to go on that road trip. It's too far. Who knows what opportunities? But, it, at the but end it's of that also big. Drive. And I've seen I've booked young talent for Wrestling Revolver, my company that like it's like, look, this is your opportunity. And like they've kind of shit the bed. You got to be ready for that opportunity. You yes. can't. You can't like yeah. have an off night on those opportunities. No, that's I made my whole career out of like making the most out of one opportunity. Yeah. So that that's another one that I wasn't that you're right. Making the most out of an opportunity, keeping yourself in the game, like being present so that those opportunities can come to you. And then another big one that I also say to people is, man, kindness is cool and you're never going to regret being nice to somebody. Just be be nice it's a very simple life lesson which it sounds like you got that from your dad you know so you being kind to carrie silken and not realizing who he was paid off not because you're like oh i'm going to be nice so that it will get me something but just be nice because that's the right thing to do and then it ends up paying off for you and all become because that carries like one of my favorite human beings on the planet and i've had a friendship yeah. with him for over 20 years now all yeah. because of one one conversation Yes. Yes. I have numerous people in my life and opportunities have come my way, you know, because somebody that I was nice to that I didn't know who they were because they weren't anybody at the time. But then I meet them later and I get an opportunity or something. Something happens simply because I was kind to this person when I didn't know who they were. I got I got a bunch of Carrie Silken stories similar to other people I've met. And I'm like, yeah, man, that, that, it pays to just be a nice person. I mean, that's a very simple life lesson, but I think an important one. So how does this Oh, and another thing that I really love too is, and I also tell this, and I think you're such a good example for this one. I say this at seminars all the time. I talk about how important it is to increase your value in any way that, Ooh. however, to do that. And one of those things that, and you said, you said it, one value that I say, hey, if you can learn video editing or photo editing or something multimedia, we're in a multimedia business. You, if you can learn that, you can either be valuable to another company or be valuable to yourself because we're in, you, you have to self market yourself. You did that before a lot of other guys were doing that. I think that's huge because you went to school for that. You're learning those things and teaching yourself all those, those skills. And then you're using them and relaying that to let's leverage this to increase my stock. I got my value. so many bookings young in my career because I was like, Oh, I'll do your website or oh, I'll do your yeah. posters. Or, oh, yeah. you, I set up so many relationships of like wrestlers that went to bat for me. I'm like, Oh, you need merch designs. Like yeah. I remember one of the first merch designs I ever did was for Tyler black randomly. Like yeah. would you, and then you look at the grand scheme of things that's happened. Like, uh -huh. like all that stuff like happens for a reason, but that's why I always tell like my young guys is like, even if you're not on shows, be there when doors open, leave, be the last person to leave. Cause you never know who you're going to meet. Like yep. it, all it takes is one good connection. And those people are going to vouch for you. It's the same thing with, I, I, I so much like, I see it online way too much. I've seen it with some of my students, but people get so upset when a company doesn't want to book them. Like, it's like, oh, well, then, then when I get really fucking good, like, I fuck them. They didn't want me before. Why would they want you? There's so many that as a kid growing up in, when I was young in the business, if someone told me no, that made me so much more be like, oh, I want to work there more than ever now. I'm going to show them that like I should be like on all their shows and be the top guy. And there's so many goals like with promotions like that weren't big in the grand scheme of things, but I wanted to work at. And it's like, well, I'm going to make myself and like squeaky wheel gets the oil. I'd stay on the promoter. Hey, this is what I'm doing now. Like I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. And then you get that one opportunity you knock it out of the park. And then you have a, like, I, I, that's so much like, that's how my entire relationship with Gabe Sapolsky started, which is kind of the next step of my journey. Like, okay. Yeah. Which is that is next that chapter of like breaks. Okay. So does that, is that eventually the one that ends up leading to you getting signed? Like, tell me about this. Like, kind of. Okay, what's this Gabe chapter? Does that involve Fit Finley, by the way? Because yes, I was yes. gonna, I want to ask you about that. One hundred percent. Okay. okay, yeah. Uh, so, 
now I'm like working CZW, Chikara. I'm like, I moved to the Northeast to like, because at the time you had to live in the Northeast to make it like, that's where all yeah. the major promotions were. Yes. Uh, I was doing ring of honor all the time, but I was like an enhancement talent. Uh, and I, I really wanted signed with ring of honor. That was like one of my big goals. Like I, I want to be there. I want to be there. Uh, I think I, I do. I think it's something stupid. Like I wrestled like 32 matches there. And never won a match. Like I was like, Oh, and 32, but I just kept <laughs> taking yeah. the bookings. Make I was on their first episode of television ever. Like oh, cool. I was like, yeah. I wasn't just a job guy. I was like, the top enhancement guy. Like I wrestled right. good guys and got to have good matches. But you were like I, Iron Mike Sharp of our own. One hundred percent. So I was doing all the Ring of Honor stuff, and I remember there was one thing. It's like they were getting really hot on me, and they're finally like, "Yo, we're gonna give you like your first like major feature match." Second half of the show, you got nineteen minutes of Austin Aries. Oh, like, wow. and I was like, and this is like right when he became like the heel character. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, like that was a big opportunity yeah. and I went out and like, this is being young and dumb at the time. And like, I hold nothing against him. Cause like looking back, like I've played it over my head. He made me look extremely fucking stupid. Like he made mm -hmm. me do stuff that I would never do. Like at one point he made me get down on all fours, like in wrestling position. It was like, Oh, look, you want to wrestle, you want to wrestle. And I remember like, I got to the back and I was so mad because I just I was listening to a veteran that but at the same point, so like he's a top guy there. Yeah. Like this new guy's like he doesn't know me from a, a rock. Like he's like, yeah. nah, fuck, fuck this kid. This kid isn't yeah. gonna have a I'm gonna like I'm doing my shit. Like fuck right. it. Right. Uh so that kind of ruined me at Ring of Honor for a while. Like I was like, Well, mm -hmm. okay, cool. Like, and that's right around that time was Evolve was starting. Yeah. Like uh because Gabe had left Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor was being ran by Adam Pierce at the time. Uh, and I remember right before Evolve, there was a moment where me and Moxley was getting really hot on the indies together, doing the Switchblade thing. And I was one of CZW's top guys, because this is like right before Evolve started. And uh, so we were getting so hot that Adam Pierce messaged us. He's like, yo, like, we love what you, we want to bring you guys in. Like, we want to, like, get you guys to, like, pretty much a deal like and we were originally supposed to be part of the american wolves like we were supposed mm. to be with davy and eddie because it was supposed to be the wolves running packs and this is when they were going to split off and do more single stuff me and him were like yeah fuck yeah that same week like two days later i did an infamous situation that it was the first kind of like mainstream coverage i got i did an incident at czw with danny havoc where i pulled a switchblade out and i cut his wrist and nah. but the way we played it was so real because like what people don't know is like people thought i really slid his wrist no he's already bleeding i we had it was a fake switchblade okay. i cut his wrist and he like wiped the blood from his face on it uh, and like wait. the locker room cleared like everything like i had to jump the guardrail i got chased down the the street at uh, <laughs> swanson and rittner people trying to fight me like yeah. they like it was so real that like on all the forums and all the dirt sheet it's like I need to be kicked out of the business because I switched Slitter Man's fucking wrist. Wow. That next day, I was like, yeah, fuck yeah. I'm like the most hated heel ever. <laughs> that next day, I get an email from Adam Pierce that says, so tell me about the Switchblade incident. I was like, oh, fuck me. Uh. So I, I fill him in that it's fake. Next response was like very cold. It was like, oh, we're going to go in a different direction. Uh. So I was like, so at that time in my life, I thought, I was like, I'm ruined. I'm ruined. Sure. But that one moment turned into like it was the best thing that ever happened to my career because mm -hmm. i went from being just a five foot eight kid to like a person that people was afraid of just and, like dangerous. The, the entire dangerous. Old, and like yeah. that was me and moxie's whole game plan at that point like we never wanted to be deathmatch wrestlers like we and like what people don't realize we only did death matches for like six months oh, and cool. then we got yeah. out of it and yep. it was like all oh, these guys can wrestle like it's yeah. like we were trained very classically as professional yeah. wrestlers like yeah. so like that helped in the long run. So right around that time, uh, evolves about to open. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, I remember Gabe wasn't a big fan of me at that time. Cause I remember when he was booking ring of honor, he was very much. So it was like, you're good. You're not, you're more of a pro wrestler than a wrestler. Like huh. if that, you know, exactly what that means. Like, <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. too much of a character. I'm too like, uh -huh. yeah. okay, cool. Like, so that was opening up. And I remember a couple people from evolve, uh, that was helping him start the pro. Like the Sammy Callahan kid, you gotta like. He's like, oh, I don't see it. 
I don't see it. Don't want to use it. And I remember I emailed him every fucking week. Like, yeah. yo, dude, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part. Of we don't got nothing. I want to be a part. Of I don't got nothing. We want to be a part of it. I want to be a part. Of it. Finally, enough people like screamed at him to give me a chance that it was uh, Evolve 3, the third Evolve show. He's like, fine, I'll give you a chance. You get like, and he straight up told me, he's like, uh, which Gabe is like, has taught me so many lessons in wrestling that like helped me get to where I was. He's like, if, it, if, if this isn't great, like we'll never use you again. Here, this is your opportunity. Uh, and it was me and Adam Cole. We were given three and a half minutes and we wow. knocked it out of the fucking park in three and a half oh, minutes yeah. to the point where I got to the back games. Like you're on all shows. Like, so I'm like, wow. Fuck it. And then dragon gate started. And uh, I remember I really wanted a contract. That was like one of my goals. Like I want a contract in wrestling. I want a contract in wrestling. I want a sure. contract in wrestling. And, I remember I had, it was like one of the first Dragon Gate USA shows. I had a match against Tozawa. It opened the show. We were given like eight minutes, like sprints, like fucking killed. And I walked to the back and got offered my first deal. I was like, oh, like, yeah, yes, with Dragon Gate and Evolve. So like, I'm doing all that stuff. I'm starting to blow off. I'm starting to go to Japan, like for different yeah. companies. Uh, I start to really make my name. And around that time, like my contract's getting ready to run up. And it's like, I, I want to go to, I want to go to, tna or wwe like because i was a big tna kid like i watched the very i remember being at my friend's house it was either freshman or sophomore year where it has grandma's and it was like late at night and we saw a commercial for tna wrestling and yeah. it was for the first show like the very first show it's like tomorrow yada 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 i was like ken shamrock scott hall i was like well we're fucking watching this hell yeah so yeah. like through all of high school like <laughs> tna at that time became like bigger than WWE to me and all my friends. Every Wednesday, mm. we'd all go to someone's house to watch the Wednesday pay per view and order food. Like that was like mm. guaranteed. So I was like, fuck yeah, I'm gonna try to go to TNA. Like this is gonna be fucking awesome. So I remember I signed up for a gut check. This is when Jeff Jarrett and then we're doing like paid gut checks. So dude was like, mm -hmm. I want to say it was like something like six or seven hundred dollars. Oh wow, yeah, okay. Like I remember those. Something yep. in there. Yep, yep. And I'm me and Tommaso Ciampa. Yeah. was was there and like we knew each other wrestling shows like oh we're partnering fucking up like let's yeah. show these people and we have this match that jeff jarrett freaks out about he comes and grabs us he's like everyone here fucking sucks you're exactly what i fucking want like we're, we're, he's like go cut pro i gotta see if you guys can talk so we went and cut like fake promos with uh jeremy borash he's like you guys can both talk he's like i'll be in contact next week we're giving you guys deals and like this is right when my evolved deals run up i was like perfect fucking timing i'm going to tna and i know at that point like alex shelley this is before i even knew him uh i found out later on him and a bunch of other tna guys like were pushing like oh this callahan kid this callahan kid this callahan mm. kid so it's like fuck yeah i'm getting signed like is the greatest day of my life never heard back from jeff jarrett I'm here tomorrow never <laughs> Never in a million years. <laughs> so at that time, like I have that match with Finley oh, that okay. like knocked me to the next echelon, yeah. like where everyone, like the rumor was every single wrestler in WWE had watched that match. Interesting. Like to the point yeah. where it's like, you're going to like, so I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm going to, I'm a, like good. Like I didn't even think that was a fucking option. Like let's fucking do this shit. Like, yeah. Um, so I remember Joey Mercury had hit me up because one of his friends Timmy Baltimore. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he was like one of Mercury's like best friends. Uh, okay. He like worked in the Maryland area. He's like, yo, like dude, like I'll get you in contact with Joey. I think like WWE would be interested in looking at you. So like, please. I remember I was on like a, I was like an hour before I left for Japan. I was on, I got a call from Joey Mercury. He's like, oh yeah, we want to book you. And this is before they did tryouts. This is when um, it was like, you get booked as an extra yep. and there was actual tryouts before the show. Yeah. And this is when someone named Ty Bailey was mm -hmm. in charge of hiring people. So yeah. I was like, oh, fuck yeah, dude. Like, yeah, I'll do it. He's like, okay, it's on this day. I was like, I get back from Japan that day. Uh, and it was like eight hours away for like the fucking extra work. I was like, I'll be there. So I legit landed back from Japan, had bags waiting for me with clean stuff at the airport and then drove to Boston. And Tommaso Ciampa was like, you stay at my house, dude. Like, I was like, oh, fuck yeah. So I went. Knocked it out of the park, freaking! I cut, I got to cut a promo for Regal and Brooklyn Brawler, and like they're like, oh my, like I I cut one of the best promos of my fucking life, and they're like, Sweet. you're the fucking man. To the point that fucking Bill Demont, who was the head trainer at FCW at the time, yep. was there working as an agent that week, and he came up to me and he's like, what if they asked? And this is where I had long crazy hair. He's like, mm -hmm. uh, what if we asked you to cut your hair? I was like. I'll cut my hair and wear a pink tutu if you want. I don't give a fuck. Like, and he's like, good answer. He's like, we'll be working together soon. And I was like, 
I'm getting fucking signed. Yeah. And then like all the rumors through people's like, oh yeah, they're going to off. Ty Bailey's going to hit you up soon. He's like off doing something international right now. Like when he gets back, like you're going to get offered a deal. I was like, fucking, I did it. Uh, didn't hear anything. Didn't hear anything. And then I it broke on all the dirt sheets. Ty Bailey fired by WWE. That's going to do it for another episode of Wrestling is Life is Wrestling with Cody Diener and part one with Sammy Callahan. We're going to end there on that cliffhanger. You've got to come back next week for part two to hear the rest of this crazy detailed story of the life and journey of Sammy Callahan. If you cannot get enough of it and you're like, Cody, you're a jerk. Why did you cut it off right there? I want to hear the rest of this conversation. Well, guess what? You can go do that right now. You don't need to wait until next Thursday. You can go to patreon.com slash Cody Diener. Sign up for a free trial and you can get the full conversation over on my Patreon right now. Where is that? Patreon.com slash Cody Diener. That helps bring a little money to me so that I can call myself a professional podcaster and keep bringing this show to you. I've almost been doing it for a year coming up on episode 52 real soon for an entire year. I'm looking forward to it and I'm looking forward to you maybe supporting some of the stuff that I'm super passionate about. And that's my sponsors. Number one, rest when dead clothing, go to Instagram at rest when dead clothing, or go to rest when dead.ca shop the entire collection and get some wicked awesome merch, just like the merch that you can see right now. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're not, why don't you go to youtube.com at Cody Diener podcast. You can check out this wicked awesome hat that I'm wearing and the t-shirts that are in the background. You can also go to ceofit.ca to get all your supplement needs to help bring your workout to the next level. Go to prowrestlingtees.com slash Cody Diener, get yourself a t-shirt, or go to cameo.com slash Cody Diener, get yourself a personalized cameo. I said at the top of the show that, man, I am busy. I'd like to be more busy. I got a couple dates open for indie spots if you want to, Drop me an email, book Cody at CodyDiener.com. That is how you can get a hold of me and bring me to your independent wrestling show this summer. This past weekend, we started the total nonstop summer tour. We started in Chicago with Against All Odds. It was a wicked awesome show. It was crazy. If you saw the show, then you know what I'm talking about. If you didn't, then why don't you go to the TNA Plus app right now and you can get against all odds as well as all the premium live events that are coming your way from TNA Wrestling. If you're listening to this when the show dropped, then you know that this weekend, or maybe, you, no, you don't know. I'm, that's why I'm telling you this. <laughs> You're going to know if you are in the Hamilton, Ontario area, that you should be coming to watch me defend my Steel City Championship in Hamilton, Ontario for top tier wrestling. Then the following weekend, June 28th and 29th, it's the next stop of the Total Nonstop Summer Tour in Philly at the EC Dub Arena for TNA Wrestling. If you want tickets to that, go to tnawrestling.com. Then, July 7th, I'm going back to Essex, Ontario for the Essex Fun Fest with Border City Wrestling. It is an awesome show. I love it so much that I got to go back again this year. Oh, I forgot. I just hopped over a date. Another date that I do every single year is part of the Italian Festival in Sudbury, Ontario. Rock Solid Wrestling comes to you. This year, it's July 4th. It's a Thursday. That's why I was looking at my calendar here, and I like skipped it over because there's not a lot of wrestling shows on a Thursday. Well, Rock Solid does. Thursday, July 4th. I'm going to be, and this is, I can't believe I missed this. I am have the opportunity to once again become the Canadian heavyweight champion in my match July 4th with Sky to the Body for Rock Solid Wrestling. They also just dropped a new Patreon themselves. It's Rock Solid Fan Club. 
Ca. I hope I got that right. Why don't you go see if I'm wrong or not? Go just type in right now Rock Solid Fan Club. Ca and see if it brings you to the Patreon of Rock Solid Wrestling. If it does, you will see there's some amazing content there. Consider pointing, uh, supporting all my buddies over at Rock Solid Wrestling. It's such a wicked awesome company. Then on July 14th, I will be at Crossfire Wrestling defending my Crossfire Tag Team Championships a long time alongside my road wife Tyler Turva then July 20th and 21st it's the next stop in the total non-stop summer tour we are going to Montreal for slam anniversary if you get the TNA plus app that I told you about earlier you will get slam anniversary right on your app and if you want to come to the show live then go to TNAwrestling.com and you can learn more about how you can go to that event. Then, man, talk about summer. Talk about hot. Talk about bringing the heat well. On August 2nd and 3rd, I will be going to Tampa, Florida with TNA Wrestling. And I haven't been to Tampa, Florida in a while. Last time I was there was the winter. I haven't been to Tampa, Florida in a, on a hot August night in a while. I'm expecting it to be wicked hot. I'm going to have to wear one of my rest when dead stringer tees probably the entire time I'm in Tampa, Florida with TNA Wrestling on August 2nd and 3rd. Go to TNAwrestling.com to get your tickets. Then I still have a busy summer continuing to go up and down the roads i'm not even going to mention where and when i'm going to be there otherwise i'm going to be here all day those are just some of the places that you can find me if you want to bring me to your event go to book cody at codier.com and i can add you to this schedule and tell all the fans about it on this reading at the end of a podcast that i am doing if you'd like to bring me to your school why don't you go to chrisgrayspeaks.com that's gray with an a and you can see all the stuff i'm offering schools this fall as i start to travel again across the nation going into schools delivering my story and the lessons i've learned along the way just like we did today with sammy callahan and just like we're going to do next week with sammy callahan for episode 49 part two where yet again we will learn the same lesson we learn every week on this show and that is that wrestling is life is wrestling we'll see you next week guys wrestling is life wrestling is life wrestling is life is wrestling